Hello out there and welcome to a new Rams podcast. We're calling it Six Ways to Sunday. Who are we? Well, I'm Kara Henderson Sneed, former NFL reporter, now the wife of Rams GM, Les Sneed, who's my co-host. And the idea that we had for this podcast, Les, which is now what, like eight years in the making, is to really look at how dynamic an NFL franchise is. If everybody else is talking about the X's and O's, we want to talk about the other 24 letters, all the things that go into making an NFL franchise successful, and also just how dynamic your job is day to day. Yeah, this, let's look at the goal, take the vision, take the fans. We want to engage with the fans, but take them beyond uh, just the headlines and really get into all the, all the dynamics, all the context, all the nuance that, that help make the headlines. I think people are really going to be interested to find out too, just how differently you can think about things because you are not, and I'm not just saying this as a homer, as the wife, you are not just your run of the mill sports person. You're very contrarian at times. You're very abstract at times, but it always comes back to football, but you're not scared to be a little bit more abstract about things. Yeah. The abstractness one time took a, I, let's call it a personality assessment, standardized test, something like that came back with that. I'm very rigid. I'm very close to type A, close to OCD, but also abstract. I remember the uh, psychologist at the time said, we've never seen one of these. And I said, yeah, I don't think it helped me <laughs> in school. But uh, as a general manager, it, it certainly allowed me to uh, let's synthesize, take information, take ideas that people are applying uh, at many other things outside of football and try to bring them into football so that, uh, you know what, we can, we can be a contender in LA. Which is a perfect transition to our first guest, who I have a feeling is going to be a regular guest on this podcast because he's become a good friend, and that's Sam Walker. Now, Sam writes for the Wall Street Journal. He writes a leadership column now. I think I first met Sam when he was a sports editor for the Wall Street Journal, and then I stalked him because he wrote an amazing book, called The Captain Class, which takes all of these dynasties, all these great teams, and takes a real deep dive into figuring out what makes them tick. And it had a interesting and counterintuitive take on it, which I knew you were going to love. And Sam, we're so excited that you're on the first episode because you're our biggest cheerleader for this. We've been talking about this for a couple years now. Well, hey, it's a huge honor to be with you guys because, you know, as soon as I got to know you and Kara, you say you stalk people, but I mean, that implies that they don't, they're not willing participants, but I mean, you, you came and had such great ideas about the book and engaged with so much. I know I'm one of many authors that you've engaged with. And the thing that I find so refreshing about both of you is just the way that you, I mean, I'm out there kind of going over the surface and regurgitating things, but you guys actually absorb so much material. You read so much, you're out there kind of bringing things in but you don't just absorb it. You actually apply it. I mean, you go and you actually apply it in the real world. So it's amazing hearing you talk about how you actually bring ideas into, into being. And that's something that is fascinating to me, but I mean, it's been great getting to know you and being in your orbit. And I was, the minute I met you, I was like, give me a podcast. What are you doing? All this information that's in your head. I mean, come on, share. This is a little selfish not to share. Yeah, it's been nice that you've been prodding because it's been like in the notes section of my phone for literally eight years because we do. We read all these books and then you automatically think back to how they tie into what you're doing in an NFL building. And these can be psychology books, philosophy books. I mean, all manner of things. And it is fascinating. It all comes back to football. And don't you find that, Sam, when you go out on the road talking about captain class, and what makes a great team that it applies so much to other spheres as well. Yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, I, the, one of the reasons I'm so glad you're doing this is I feel like football is due. I mean, it's, it's time for us to take a different look at it because you know what I learned in going out, I do a lot of speaking I talk to a lot of different kinds of groups and you know, my book is, is really been most absorbed by business people. But what I've found when I go out and talk to people is that uh, you know, being in a business leading an, in an organization is so idiosyncratic because, you know, what it takes to sell air conditioners is a lot different than what it takes to command a naval warship, right? So 
the context is so important. So if you talk about, you know, a challenge of a leader in business, you know, it's, it's so much depends on context. What I love about football is I think it's the best laboratory in the world for studying leadership. And, and I, sports is a great laboratory, but I think football is the best because it's such a big organization. There's three teams in one, and there's no way one person can affect the outcome. But it's also a static environment. I mean, the rules are the same. The economics are the same. The, you know, really what it comes down to is, you know, everyone faces the same decisions. So how well do you make those decisions? And that's the thing that's so fascinating about it because, you know, if you think about leadership, you know, there's all these nuances to it, but, you know, what's important is what's universal, right? I mean, there's, there's 25 things every leader does, no matter what they're engaged in. So let's focus on those things and, and how you do them better. And football is such a controlled environment that you're really able to distill it down and isolate these leadership behaviors in a way you can't do one anywhere else. And, you know, I don't want to knock the military and there's other institutions that create great leadership, but, you know, I spent a lot of time with, with the Marine Corps Commandant Robert Neller. And, you know, one thing he said to me was, look, war is a failure. You know, war means that, that other people didn't do their jobs and diplomacy failed. So you never, you know, in an ideal world, you won't have to fight. So the only way to prepare is to get reps in your head, to read history, to, you know, prepare mentally. But that's the great thing with the NFL because you're going to play every week. You're going to go out and actually execute, and, and all those decisions will get a verdict, and, and there'll be a verdict rendered. So you're able to iterate and, and change and try new things and change directions. So um, I think it's it's massively important. So this is – it's it's interesting, and when you read Sam's book, Captain Class, right, uh, I came away probably with two, let's call it perspectives, and, and when – when Kara connected us, one being uh, Sam really studied, let's call it these elite teams. And then obviously I called it in your chiropractor mode, right? And in, in your study and in your research, you came to the conclusion these teams ticked. One of the big reasons they ticked was the leadership, the captain, the unique person. Now the, the other perspective that I really enjoyed as I chatted with Sam, because it's, it's what a GM, it's one of the uh, main objectives, main things we do is, is build teams, not just collect t- talent. So some of the crumbs were, uh, I call it for like a general practitioner. Chiropractor means, guess what? You go see the chiropractor and the chiropractor cures the flu. If you have a toothache, it's all just crack your back. And so that's kind of captain class, right? The captain cures everything but was what was fascinating as I chatted with Sam too. And that's, and we'll take it in two different ways today. We'll drill down on some leadership, but also on those crumbs from that general practitioner uh, type deal where you actually studied these elite teams. And, and we know it was more than just going and let's say picking the, you know, the team captain and then the rest took care of itself. There was so many complimentary parts uh, to those teams from top to bottom, from, you know, players to backups to coaches to uh, staff people behind the scenes. And that's what I've found fascinating is, and it's what we do in football as, as I had said, good friend of ours uh, who eventually hopefully will be on here. Jim Collins has, when he came to visit said, this is what was his quote is one of the more sophisticated systems of human collaboration that he'd ever studied. So I think that's the way we can, uh, take today's conversation is begin with the broad and and let's talk about building teams and not, you know, not just collecting talent. And then we will fascinatingly get to uh, let's call it the more specific, the more microscopic. uh, How do you, how would you say you learned that lesson? So this is, I can't believe this is true, Sam, but this is his ninth season as general manager, and it does seem as a general manager that a lot of your lessons are going to be learned the hard way. Uh, There is a lot of losing when you take over a team that you need to rebuild, but how would you say that you learned that, because you have a tendency to take a lot of lessons and then almost boil them down into aphorisms, and that kind of remind you of what that means, and that's, I hear you say that a lot, we're not just collecting talent. We're building a team. What does that mean to you? Before you answer, Sam, I'm probably one of the only GMs to use 
uh, the word syphilis, right, at a, at, a, at a combine podium. But I was trying to articulate how experience and failing miserably uh, definitely leads to uh, improvement and application and getting better and solutions. That's uh, because it took what, I can't remember how many times to find a cure for syphilis, like 600 plus. Kevin Demoff is going to be thrilled that you're bringing syphilis back into the equation. He was laughing the whole time. When and we have that. one more word for Kevin at some point. No, but so, so take us back to, so I ask, I'm asking you the question. I was asking you the question. When did you become like mindful of coming up with that line? Hey, it's not just collecting talent. It's building a team. When do you think that philosophy really got hammered home for you? The, the philo- so there's when, when I became general manager, fortunate enough to get the general manager job at St. Louis in 2012, uh, it was rock bottom. It was maybe for the previous five years of losing us. It was 32nd in number of wins and, and probably 10 games out of 31. So you had no chance of making the, the wild card there. So there was that element of uh, the building phase where you really could just collect talent. But at some point, all of that talent has to work together. It has to, it has to mesh. It has to become symbiotic. It has to become complementary to basically uh, produce and, and get the results of, of what we're all wanting is winning those four quarters. So somewhere in that phase of just building to going, okay, how do we actually break through? And then once we break through, how do we actually continue to contend in a very dynamic, uh, as Sam mentioned, you know, very dynamic structure, even though there's structure there, but there's always a uh, moving part. So uh, definitely figured out that uh, like an orchestra, like the human body, a, a football ecosystem definitely has to complement each other, has to be symbiotic, has to work together, has to collaborate, has to mark and march in the same direction and it is very easy on Sunday afternoons over a 16 game schedule to figure out which organizations are doing that and which which ones are not. Sam I always think of it like um, if you think about a piece of music and you know you could just think about the notes separately but what makes it a beautiful piece of music is the way that the notes connect to yeah. each other and I you know I, I thought of you so often as we were watching the documentary on the bulls that we all watched in quarantine, because that's what you really took away from it. It wasn't, you know, obviously they had some amazing parts and you have to have the, that world-class talent. You, they had two of the best players in the NBA and in, in Michael Jordan, and Scottie Pippen, but it was really how they complemented each other that made the story what it was. What did you think about when you were watching that and then also relating it back to football? Oh, exactly the same. I mean, you know, I've always, I really had to study Michael Jordan very closely because people think of that as the model for what a leader is. And by my profile of great captains, he didn't fit. I mean, he'd fit in some ways, but not in others. You know, but what I ultimately realized was that, you know, there were other people who were leaders on that team. Bill Cartwright kind of being the classic person holding it together. But Michael Jordan played an important role. He was that sheriff, that motivator, that, you know, and I, you, you realize that, like, he was playing that role at great personal cost. It wasn't, you know, I mean, there were sacrifices he made to be that tough and to be that difficult on people. But that's what a team needs. It needs a combination of voices and styles. The thing that blows me away, and I mean, the fact that, you know, Les talks about this and the team concept and says that over and over, one of the great Les systems, I have a list of them, by the way. So, no, thanks. Oh, you're going to have to get into this. It's microscopic and not tele- and telescopic, which is one of my favorite. But, um, but, but one of the things that, that just in saying that I thought was so, is so important because you know, we were talking about this article, Kara, that, we, that I sang from Behavioral Scientists, and it's, a, it's really interesting, but it's, it's about you know, the problem of rewarding individuals in, in a collective group and how that promotes you know, affluence, you know, affluent people. That was the point that I took from that though, is the point I see all the time, which is I don't understand businesses. I, you know, I talk to them and they're like, well, we have this great team. What do we do? Right? Well, a, a team succeeds. What do we do? You know, we go in and we look at the, the high individual performers You know, the person who had the greatest numbers, the best form. And we promote that person, right? So you have this team structure that works and you take the person who had the highest results, but 
that person's results are a symptom of that team's unity and cohesion. It's like, who built that platform, you know, that that person is, is benefiting from. And it's like, so we don't reward the people who are actually in there holding the team together and doing that work because leadership is so invisible. I mean, it happens behind the scenes. It's, it's in smaller interactions and we don't look for leadership in the right moments. It's not about the big triumph or the crushing loss. A lot of times it's like these run of the mill moments where things could go wrong, but they don't because if someone holds everything together quietly and selflessly without getting any credit or attention. So, you know, there's so many elements that go, as Les said, into, into that orchestra playing, into the music sounding good, um, that, that you have to pay attention to, to the synchrony and not to the outcome, you know, and the whole NFL media. I mean, you talk about the X's and O's, but, you know, it, it, it's also all the stats and all the stats are so individualistic. And it's America, right? We invented the Hall of Fame. We love pulling individuals out of the team setting and saying this person's amazing. But, you know, we don't pay enough attention to, to that uh, synchrony and what it takes to actually create the platform for that kind of individual success. So, you know, the fact that you're even thinking along those lines is very different, especially in sports where it's so easy to get swept up in someone's statistics that, um, you know, I find that super refreshing. Sam, somewhere, maybe not at this moment, but I remember, we'll go back to a conversation when uh, you you mentioned to me that you had discussed with Steve Kerr and, and his thought process that nowadays there's not just one leader, there may be more than one. And then when you really dove into it, it was really enlightening to to see all the ways you can lead. And, and even as a general manager who it's a leadership position, I was blown away by, wow, you can be a, you don't have to be the CEO, the QB, the GM, the head coach. I mean, you, you can be a backup. You can be in the mailroom and be a leader. We'll get to that. The interesting thing, again, what I call the crumbs of, of your book, and we can, we can keep it on the, everybody watched or a lot of people during quarantine watch the last dance in bulls. One of the interesting thing, and I'll try to relate it to football and then y'all tell me when we get boring, but the symbiotic, the orchestra, the complementary pieces, right? How even uh, Phil Jackson, and again, I'm going to, Carol will tell you he's a, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Phil. I've only read his books, never met him. So it's always been a dream of mine to meet Phil Jackson, but not, not stalking him at this point. He doesn't seem like the type that likes to be stalked. But <laughs> there was, yeah, right, in some you know, remote cabin. Right? Yeah, we just so happened to um, vacation on that same lake, Sam. What a oh. dink. dink. We had never been there I before. Did think, I do think we Googled. How did that happen? Yeah, we Googled and <laughs> maybe rode by his cabin, what have you. But it, no Great one was grilling, so we didn't, we didn't do anything. But the complimentary piece of, of probably him and, and, and Tex Winter and just reading some of the books, you know, Tex maybe uh, was very scheme-oriented and interestingly probably Phil had the gift, right, of explaining how those complimentary parts those roles work together and, and simplified it and got people to believe in it. But it very, it, it can happen on an NFL staff and let's just microscopically look at uh, a defensive staff within a defensive staff. You have a defensive coordinator, but he and every one of this position coach really has to be symbiotic and people think, well, that that's, that's, that's that's they're on the same staff they are but when you a lot of times when you're a coordinator you may inherit coaches the head coach may hire someone what have you but if your defensive line coach right doesn't have the same let's call it uh, a rush plan and that let's let's get the third down and important down football we're going to go rush we're going to attack the QB if if that scheme doesn't mesh with the back end, the the linebackers, the corners, the safeties, and what they're trying to accomplish back there, then you'll be out of sync. And and those two things have to complement each other. And it happens a lot of times in, in the NFL. If if your coaching staff is not on the same page, that's just within a defensive staff. Same thing on on an offensive staff. And like you said, you've got to have three staffs really work together, go into a game plan, and it, and it could be. One one day keeping the ball away from let's 
let's call it the Kansas City Chiefs right now, right? Do you really want to get into a scoring fest with them? So there may be this element of, of keep away going on and, and, and time of possession and all three phases have to, to work together. It can be, we, we have a great player in Aaron Donald, but who do you, who do you line up beside him on first and second down? And then even on third down, Right. Because that's two different things you're trying to do. If it's if there's a chance that the, the run pass ratio is 50 50. Right. Let's let out, uh, Aaron go do his thing, but maybe need more disciplined players to be in the gap to build that wall in those. Uh, let's call it maybe rundowns. But then maybe when it's known passing, you, you put more creative artists on the field. So every decision that's made that's just with players, that's coaching staff, whether it's sports science, working with the traditional old school strength and conditioning coaches, and even your coaching staff on what's the best method, you know, to prepare your player to be ready and primed on Sunday. And and what do you do Monday through Saturday? And what do you do in October so that in December that player is still primed? And, And if there's any shade, if you're a shade off, you, you, can, you can get to January and your players be worn down because maybe you, we worked them too hard uh, and the, there was philosophical differences. And it, can't, it doesn't have to be intentional or evil or trying to sabotage the program. It can just be uh, paradigms and different mentors and, and training going on. So in teams and bulls, I always think about what Phil Jackson – did the most and everybody said, Oh, he's the easy, right? He always had great players, but to get those players, right. To, to buy into the, we, we say, we, not me a lot to buy into the, we, and again, like you said, this is America. This is hall of fame. This is score. Who, who, who's the scoring leader, not who's the assist leader, but to get those great players to, to buy in, to be complimentary of each other. Sam, it's interesting. Let's talk about your book for a second because it all circles back to what we were talking about. When I read your book and your book came out and Aaron Donald had just been drafted. So we had lived maybe one, maybe two seasons with him and you knew from the beginning, okay, this, this cat is just wired differently. You know, he is just, he is already there. He was ascendant from the moment he hit the field. And I remember when I read your book, I was like, ooh, Aaron Donald could be this guy, Aaron Donald could be this special kind of leader that is not always like the intuitive leader that people think about that's rah-rah out in front and blah, 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 but leads in a different kind of intense way. And I think that's what we saw in the Bills game. And what's so interesting about football is because you don't just have one captain, you have a whole you know, subset of captains on your team that represent all these different areas. They're like, you know, the head managers for each part of the, you know, the, the, the team, you do get, they, they're able to play different roles at different times. And I think Aaron Donald, as we all saw, and as we often see in the second half, when the poor person that's across from him has now been worn out from having to hand fight him for, you know, a half of football, he just has this next level gear. And so he does have this specific, superpower subset and then there are other players like the robert woods the cooper cup also captains who have these other leadership qualities and i know as you two have talked and kind of worked together you've kind of developed sam some different leadership buckets that i think people would be kind of interested in some of these personality types because then it's fun to go watch a game and be like oh he's he's a sheriff he's a this he's a that so kind of in a, in a, you know, give us the, the, the short kind of, uh, kind of rundown of some of the personality types. And th- Sam, this is where somewhere along the way, if I remember, we'll, we'll transition. I'll synthesize this back to how uh, Steve Wozniak from Apple, right? And maybe Igadala, right? How they, what they have in common. Yeah. In, in the buckets of leaves. So I'll, t- I'll tell you how we get there, but I'll let you, th- this is where your conversation, I think with Steve Kerr, there was this element of, okay, maybe in generations before there may have been this one captain, but maybe 
in sports now and and maybe more in the NBAs and and NFLs because it is dynamic. Uh, you you know it's not the the all blacks that stay together forever. There is movement where okay, wait a minute, there's this there's these buckets and different roles and multiple leaders. Yeah, well, there's all right. There's a two misconceptions about leadership, right? That that I learned in writing this book because I came in not knowing anything about leadership. I didn't know that's where this was going. Um, but the first one is that where do we get our ideas about what a leader is, right? I mean, I, I realized like I had all these ideas about what a leader is supposed to do, what a leader's like, and I don't know where I got them. Probably Hollywood, right? You watch movies, yeah, eighties movies, right? Yeah, you watch like you know all these these sports movies, and you think that's that's it's always the same. So, you know, you think superstar, you know, charismatic, you know, a great diplomat, brings the team together, all these things. A special person who's very obviously special. What I quickly discovered was a lot of these captains, I'd never heard of them. They got no credit. They were not stars or famous. They were people who did things that were invisible. So leadership's not obvious. It's actually a different kind of behavior than what we expect. And people don't realize that. The other thing is we invest too much in the idea of a leader, a solitary leader figure who does everything, right? And so people come to a team and they think, look, I either have leadership or I don't, right? It's either I've been granted the right to lead or I have not. And that's the problem because, you know, we spend so much time looking for that perfect leader. There's very few perfect leaders out there. Um, you need someone at your core who just cares more. But what I realized when I looked at these great dynasties, I spent so much time looking at the individual captains but even the captain said, look, I don't do everything. I couldn't do it. And that's what Kerr said. He's like, we've got Andre Iguodala, who's really our rock and our center. But we'd be lost without Draymond Green and his fire and energy. And we'd be lost without Steph and his professionalism and his buy-in and his calm head. So, you know, he said, it's that triumvirate with me working with them is what makes the whole thing work. And all these other supporting cast members in the locker room. So, I started looking back at the teams again and thinking that's exactly it. Like the mistake is that we think leadership is imbued in one person, but you know, my favorite academic Richard Hackman, who was a psychologist who, who, uh, at Harvard who died, you know, about 10 years ago. I mean, he had this theory, he would embed himself with these high performing teams. And his theory was all that really matters is that every important leadership function inside that uh, group is getting handled by somebody. You know, it doesn't have to be the leader doing everything as long as someone's taking care of every important job. And the light bulb just went on for me. And I thought, you know what? Like, we think team chemistry is this big mystery. And we think it all comes down to leadership and coaching. But if you think about it, you can sit down and say, what are the important leadership functions on this team, on an NFL team? You know, you need a sheriff, you need a connector, you need a confidant, you need a papa bear. You need, you, you need all these different roles to be played. And, you know, why can't we just sit down and say, here are all the roles, who's doing them, you know, how well are they doing? Isn't that a pretty good indication of what our leadership is like? And when you present it to players that way, you realize, look, you know, no one can be the ultimate leader because nobody can do everything. You can't have all the different elements of personality to handle everything. You'd have to be, you know, omniscient. You'd have to have every, no one can do that. So a great leader will want help because they know how difficult the job is of one of the people to help. So that was kind of where we started going with this, which is can you actually sit down um, and, and stop thinking about whether someone has leadership, capital L leadership potential, but, you know, how can they lead? How can this person who may not be your ultimate captain, what contribution can they make to leadership? And can you actually systematically go through your team and can you, can you do it through player acquisition and can you, and, and, personnel moves to try to build a collective that has all those elements covered where someone's doing every single job. It takes a range of personality types, takes different temperaments and different um, ideas and different um, uh, personalities. But can you actually purposefully assemble a group that will have all those complementary skills? I mean, the way I start thinking of a football team is it's like looking at your reflection 52 different funhouse mirrors right i mean it's it's you being reflected back but it's slightly altered and you look a little different maybe you look scarier you know or funnier or, or or you know more thoughtful you know in your reflection you're very similar you have similar ideas and culture you share basic instincts about how a team should operate but you're all slightly different and you're bringing something else into the equation so 
The way I think about it, Sam, it's like a, um, cause you think about it, what an organization, right? Like you think about an organization, like the word organ is in there. So you think about like a human body. And so you have all these different parts that have to perform much like all very important and powerful roles, but they have to be, you know, connected in a way that they're all going in the same direction. You know, we've all seen the dream teams, quote unquote, who end up becoming kind of Frankensteins because they are just brought together and not thought about how are they going to connect once they get together and do they perform these particular kinds of roles. And I think that's what's interesting about our team now. And now that they're, you know, it's not a super young team and you're able to kind of fill in the complementary parts. I mean, they feel like you've got this really great group of leaders that are now on this team and that really play for each other. And you can see it last on Sunday when, when they're, you know, picking each other up throughout the entire game. Well, it's interesting. We're the third youngest team in the NFL. So with that, and we'll go, uh, we'll go to the book tribe. And I know tribe can get nowadays a negative, uh, probably what is negative competition connotation. Yes. Yeah, so, but, Let's look at it. Anything can be used for good and evil, and there's a lot of really good tribes. In our case, uh, who wrote, who wrote, who's Sebastian Younger? Yeah, so great quote, right? The national governor amongst the tribe, and, and in our case, the team uh, is the respect is the respect the player garners based on skill, right? So that's maybe the skill he brings, his talent, how he's produced. Very important. There's a comma there. Role. And then comma, humility within role, number of years on the team per se. So there's, there's, it's, it's interesting. If you, if we go, if we're, if we're missing an important ingredient that we need, right. There's this element. Can you go bring that person from another team? Well, that person may not. Now the number of years within our team is very low, right? It's at zero. And then it's at day one, day two. How long does it take that person to become the leader within our ecosystem. Same with Rooks, because they obviously have skill to get drafted, but have they earned their role yet and all that. So we're always, when you're building a team and not just collecting talent, you're always looking at that, right? What's the role? How long have they been here? So do we need to develop the the young player, right? They have this leadership potential, but maybe they just want to take a back seat you know, you know how it is being a freshman in high school per se, and you may feel like, okay, I'm pretty good, but I, I'm gonna let the senior lead until it's until my time. Yeah, until so I it's on us to uh, enlighten these young kids on. Look, this is, uh, and Sam's helped us a lot with this. Like, this is the way you become can become a leader. This is what we need. And as, as they earn their role, as they have years within us, they, they grow into that. And same with, same with the, the veterans. So there's a lot different, you know, it's the difference between big wit and uh, Cam Akers, who we just drafted, and then Cooper Cup, who we drafted three years ago, and, and this is year four, and we just extended him. He's going to be with us now for a while. So he's, he's probably ready to – really thrive as as a leader so what sean and i do right is it, we're always looking at what skill set do we need what roles do we need and then also uh and that's just that's just producing on the field but also what what do we need in the locker room uh to help sean to help his staff to help help our ecosystem thrive Are, were you surprised or can you at least it- elucidate for Rams fans how integral it was when you brought in Andrew Whitworth, because it is interesting to have a guy who's that, you know, has been in the league for that many years to come in and be able to do that, that quickly, especially with a young coach. We have been collecting a lot of talent. We were always, because we were building one of the younger teams with, would write this subjective outsider's view of, let's call it talented players under the age of 25 or what have you. Uh, what, what we quickly realized when we brought in someone like Witt, very important that Witt could still play because if all of a sudden a veteran comes in and let's say he's, he's 
not playing as well and the quarterback's getting sacked, it, the, it's hard for that player to lead, right? Now his dad yeah, is his down. His is above, is down. Yeah, his stater, status is above his stature. I but guess I'd put it that what, way. What, what we quickly learned in where I'm like, wow, that was a few years too late as a GM that, that when you do have a young team, when you have these young and up-and-coming contributors – to mix them with the right veterans to, to help show them the way or be a, a sounding board when, when the adversity, all, all the things that, and Sam can, you can go down your list. I think that'd be great for the viewers, right? Go down your list of all the buckets, right? And WIT provides a lot of them, but having that uh, Papa Bear, right? That's more than just, I call it the principal or the head coach, right? The, the front office, uh, let's call it preaching a message per se. It's, it's actually a peer. It's actually somebody who's, who most of these young players would love to at least have a very similar career, a length of career, all of those things being that Papa Bear. Well, you guys mentioned a couple of people that are perfect examples of this and Aaron Donald and Cooper Cup. So, I mean, that's such a great comparison because this is what I love about football. I mean, this is why I think football is really like part of American exceptionalism. And I say this and people think it's hilarious, but, you know, think of the money that we spend as a country on youth sports and football is our most popular youth sport. Like we don't have the best schools in the world. We have the best companies, you know, because I think we make this huge investment. People learn in these frameworks how to lead and how to be part of a team. And it's one of our great strengths as a country, but this is why it works because, and the brutality of football, and it talks about the brutality of concussions and anyone is worried about the violence. But here's the thing about that. Look at Aaron Donald, right? Aaron Donald is a leader, but he's someone who leads through toughness and physical courage. And, and that doesn't help you at Microsoft, right? I mean, no, you know, that doesn't help. I'd you love to see that. That would be great. Have, like, you know, what was we'll it? get to Steve Wozniak maybe at Apple <laughs> during the Steve Jobs years. Yeah, well, same thing. Like, you know, maybe yeah, you need a toughness. Like, uh, you know, the visionary and the driver and the sheriff, and they have Wozniak who's kind of, kind of making all the pieces fit, and he's much more personable, and he's connecting people. Um, but, but the 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 example with Don. So, you know, in football. You can lead like that because you can. It takes all kinds of leadership to run a football team. So you got Aaron Donald as that warrior figure. Then look at Cooper Cup. I mean, Cooper Cup is an incredibly, like, an extraordinary intelligent guy. Like in terms, I mean, in terms of his football, he's like up there with quarterbacks. I mean, he's one of probably one of the brainiest people in the entire league, right? And he's got the mind of a strategist. He's not a fiery rah rah guy who's going to knock your socks off and give that big pregame speech. He's a strategist. He understands everything. He knows his job is everyone's job. He sees things other people don't see, he collaborates with the coaching staff quietly in a quiet way. That's another form of leadership, which is he's a strategist, right? He's someone who, you know, is, is doing a completely different contribution to leadership. So, you know, those two guys are exceptional in what they do. And if you can find one person in all those categories we talked about, sheriff, um, you know, warrior, rule bender, you know, papa bear, connector, communicator. If you can find someone who's elite at that one thing, that one little thing, and you can put him inside that team, uh, and they're doing that one thing at an elite level, um, I feel like that's all you need. I mean, you need talent, you need strategy, you need coaching, you need luck, you need all those other things that any team needs. But if you want to sustain excellence, if you want to keep it going, you want to build a culture that actually sustains excellence for a long period of time. Um, that's the only way to do it is to have people in all those roles who are exceptional at that one small thing that no one will ever notice or give them credit for. And, you know, when I see Robert Woods, you know, who's got superstar talent and I see some of the blocks that guy's, that guy throws, I mean, it's just like, it's unbelievable. That's why he gets a nickname fullback yeah. on our yeah. team. And I was watching practice yesterday and he was pulling around making a block and I'm like, you know, fullback, he's really a, a guard. I mean, there's in, you make a great point in in what that type of let's call it selflessness for a wide receiver. I mean, you got to go back to to Heinz Ward. All right, Sam. So I'll put you on the spot since yeah. you have you do you take a lot of time to watch videos of players and you listen to them talk because how somebody describes things makes a huge difference. You can tell about their humility and their fire starting ability, all that. So when you look at our team and obviously a lot of the people who are listening are Rams fans. 
talk about the, you know, what you've seen from our team in terms of, you know, these leaders, these leaders on the field. Okay. So let's go macro, right? I mean, one thing I realize is like when you're building a team, wherever you are, whether it's a business or a, a sports team, you, you kind of got to know what your team is and what it does. And for me, the Rams are this we, not me culture is real, but with that, it's really an execution oriented team. You play fast. There's a huge emphasis on, um, you know, strategy on intelligence on, on, um, you know, uh, playing with a kind of great cohesion and intensity and speed. Um, and when you have an execution based team, it's a little different. What you need from your leadership is a little different. You need, um, you really need connection. You know, everyone needs to feel connected to each other so that they're going to play at that level. You don't need as much contagion. You don't need people who are necessarily as fiery and rah-rah, you know, because, because everyone's already bought in and they're all, they're, 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 they're focused on the outcome. Uh, they don't need to be pulled back into, into that. Um, you do need some conflict at times. You need, you need some people who can come in and, and reorient and pick people up when the, when the, tensions failing or whatever, but that's the kind of team you have. And for, for that, uh, you need people who are like wit, who are just emotional rocks, you know, we're not going to be, and Jared Goss very good at this, shaking off adversity, being able to, to continue and, and, and not let the last player the last game beat you again. Um, and you have a ton of that. Um, and you also have, um, I mean, there's, a, it's kind of up and down the board. You need a, this level of selflessness and connection. So, you know, the selflessness, Robert Woods, in the way he blocks, is such a great example of being a water carrier, someone who will do anything to help the team win without ego. Um, you have a ton of players like that. You also have these, these guys who are just great connectors. John Johnson, you know, is a guy who's got this magnetic personality who is so good at, you know, so good at, at, at dealing with different kinds of people and, and such a, a, a compelling person, always upbeat, always – bringing people together and, and Tyler Higby, you know, kind of has the same kind of character and that he's someone who can relate to anybody. You know, he's very tribal. He's very focused on his teammates. He's not that interested in the outside world and, you know, giving interviews, but inside the team, he's very, um, he's very much a connector. So you, know, you have these people in those key roles for the Rams. You have strategists like Cooper Cup, you have you know, emotional rocks and people who are very uh, composed um, but you also have those connectors that are making sure that everyone's buying into the team culture. So, you know, it's fascinating to look at because, you know, this, this is before I even started looking at it, I can see there's a pattern, like there's a less kind of player. And I think, I think it's so important because if you're building a culture, a team culture, you know, you need people who are very different, but they all have to have that basic quality they share. It's, it's a, it's a subtle thing. It's a set of, small personality traits and instincts that are very powerful in these people that can override, you know, all their selfish concerns. And, and I see it constantly when I look at the players, there is a fundamental kind of character to a Rams player that you guys have, have ingrained and figured out and you keep, you're incredibly good at finding those kinds of people and bringing them into the team culture. And from that platform, then you figure out what they do and who they are and how they can contribute um, and you do a nice job of pushing it into that lane where they can make the biggest contribution. So, I mean, you know, Jim Collins is right. It is the most incredible, you know, system of human coordination um, I've ever seen. And I mean, it's amazing that, that there is a, there is a, there is a method and there is a ethos that you have, even if you can't articulate it. I mean, that's how I feel. What do you think, Wes? It, it, you made a, good point and it'll, I'll get to a few levels but we're a very like you said we're a very execution based team so there and this is for Kevin Dimoff to use a line and it may not relate but the baseball line we're above the Mendoza line right in terms of of having talented players with enough skill uh, to win in the NFL kind of in their prime we've got now what we do with that is to be determined and up to us. So even when we're when we're drafting, you're bringing on young players, and this would be a asterisk for fans out there, right? There, 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 there's there's times there's a method to uh, we're going to bring on this player. 
let's use Daryl Henderson, Daryl Henderson, who's had a breakout few games for us the last two, but didn't play as much as a rookie. Uh, there's a method to the madness in that because we're so surgical, right? When we onboard somebody, you better be able to do surgery. If you're not quite ready to do surgery yet, we've got to, right, put you through med school, maybe that rookie, or even your, your sophomore year, and then you're ready to go be a surgeon. There, there are certain players who, Cooper Cup being one, uh, Jordan Fuller being one that we drafted in the sixth round this year that, right, they uh, won't share all the secrets, right, but because of the ingredients they brought to the table, they were surgeons right out of eastern Washington and Ohio State, and they could they could assume a role on a very surgical execution-based team right now. But Jordan Fuller may not be that leader that we need on defense, like you mentioned with a, a John Johnson, right? That that just doesn't happen automatically. Even though Jordan might have all the ingredients, all the DNA to be a, to blossom into one of our future leaders, but right now he's focused on right executing his role and and continuing to do that as successful. It's similar to what you say the leaders can do, right? With star players like okay, let Jordan go focus and utilize all his energy on being the star player. What's really a star player, right? Well, he was playing really good defense, scoring a lot of points, and when they needed a shot, when no one else would have wanted to take it because your heart rate would have been out, get the ball. That takes energy, and sometimes you you don't necessarily need to ask that person to also do everything else, right? It's it's up to – uh, and that's what I think all everyone who's listening can apply, right? If we're not even doing football, is it doesn't matter where you are, right? On the hierarchy, on the depth chart of of right life, family, wherever you're at, whatever phase you're in, you can you can do something, right? You can bring something to the table to connect the group, to fire up the group, to energize the group, uh, uh, to collaborate, to and collaboration usually used to, I mean, usually leads to some sort of impactful innovation that you'll be talking about for a long, many years. We could continue this conversation forever because we often do. Sam, I'm going to let you get just the last word, kind of a takeaway for a Rams fan that's listening, whether it's a life takeaway from what you've learned watching this in football or something that you've seen with the Rams that you want people to just kind of take away And then also, um, I'm going to put you on the spot and make, we're going to have to post these character types and their uh, personal personality characteristics so people can kind of have a little cheat sheet and decide for themselves who they think certain people are. What do you think? Yeah, sure. I'll send you the, I'll send you the cut up on that. Um, You know, what's, what's amazing to me is, you know, when I think about, when we're seeing inside a football team, getting the glimpse I have of how it actually all operates. Um, you know, I came in thinking, okay, you know, sports is a great laboratory for leadership. Football is probably the best one because it's such an intense team sport. Um, but what's amazing is just the, the level of uh, the different things that go into it. Right. So if you look at less as a GM, I mean, we're talking about, you know, measuring raw potential. We're talking about measuring character. We're talking about, then, then you have to translate that to scheme fit, culture fit. Then there's dollar value. How do you place a value on that person? Then there's like, do they have long-term value, right? And, and are they a long-term piece for the team? And then sometimes you have to do the whole thing in reverse and, and back it all up and say, it's time to cut ties with somebody. So, you know, it's, it's every, element of human potential and how it fits in, in synchrony with the group. And then sometimes it's unraveling all of that at the same time. So, you know, it's an incredible, it's so intellectually engaging and it's so complex and it takes, you know, what Les always talks about, the telescopic, the microscopic and the way you make decisions and, and the idea you're always talking about um, civilized descent you know, and, and how you, you, you're, you want to find the truth and not get anchored to ideas and anchored to players, um, which I think is so, I mean, it's, it's all 
incredibly relevant to, to every, every other kind of business and, and everything that you do when you're trying to do a collaborative effort. And, uh, um, you know, the fact that you actually have to go out and, and have a, get a grade every week, you know, and, and it's not theoretical. It's like, okay, it's either going to work, you know, on Sunday or it's not. Um, just, you know, makes it a, one of the most kind of fascinating environments. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if you ask me like where I could embed myself, you know, in, in any kind of business or organization, I can't think of a better one. If you want to learn and you want to see, be able to experiment and test theories. and, and um, Sam, you, you found my secret. That's what I did. I embedded myself onto an NFL team. I was a reporter and then I decided, you know what, I'm going to go inside. But I think you just described the best way that I can, you know, kind of think about the podcast. That's what we want people to understand, to feel through stories and microscopic, telescopic ways, just how interesting and dynamic and changing. It's like a, this calculus formula that's changing over time and you don't know what the, you know, there are all these variables. What are the constants? It's, it's fascinating. But at the end of the day, Les, what did you say to me yesterday? When you were uh, you were going to work, you said you were getting ready for the draft. All of a sudden, you were back to getting ready to the draft. So at the end of the day, Sam, yeah, we're, and last, we that's got what a week, and then we'll we'll begin. I, I just as an asterisk or tidbit, FYI, I love to try to do film preparation for the draft. Right, eighty to ninety percent over these next few months, and those months being October, November, December when there is there's routine right there's games being played everybody's in a routine so once we get to january uh playoff time uh, hopefully uh a long journey there and then february and then march so there's combines and there's pro days and free those are very choppy months so it's there's a lot of disruption there so hard to get in a routine so draft starts in about a week and and i always say right we're we're trying to build a game prep yeah draft prep we're in in you, it's a very complicated, sophisticated thing, but I think what we're trying to do, the the very simple, uh, maybe algebra formula, maybe it's just simple uh, addition is, right? There's some element of tangible plus element of intangible that equals uh, the role that every player, coach, uh, trainer, nutritionist, uh, nerd, our analytics team, uh, everyone else in our building scout GM plays. And, and that that's the form that we all bring some tangible and we all bring some intangible. And then there's those two, you know, mesh combined and there's a role that we play. And, and within that role, there's this bigger we that all these roles are adding up to. And it's up to us to keep that thing uh, in harmony, symbiotic, uh, keep the diseases out. Keep the cancers out for sure. All right. So Sam Walker, everybody can find your book, The Captain Class, on what makes the greatest teams, not only in the country, but around the world great um, on Amazon or wherever you get your books. We're going to have you back on the podcast frequently because not only are you a friend, you're a collaborator, and you're the kind of person we like to chop things up with um, here on Six Ways to Sunday. So this was... The first episode of Six Ways to Sunday, we're going to have guests. We're going to answer your questions. So if you want to send questions in to me, at Kara Henderson on Twitter. Les isn't on Twitter. He kind of is. He's a, he's a looky-loo on my account. So you can send questions in um, for Les. And I'm sure, you know, this is going to evolve over time, as you like to say, Les. We'll have questions. We'll have guests from all different spectrums that are going to come back to one thing, football. This is Six Ways to Sunday. You can find it on Spotify, on Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.